Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, now four minutes past the appointed starting time, so that guarantees the catholicity of what we're doing. We never quite start on time, do we? Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming along. We're very fortunate this evening to have Father Bernard Teo with us. Uh, Bernard's known to uh, some, perhaps even all of you. Uh, he's certainly been here before. Uh, Bernard is uh, a redemptorist priest and uh, a moral theologian, a very engaging speaker, a very challenging speaker. Uh, tonight, as we know, um, he's going to reflect with, this on, uh, reflect with us on the papacy of Pope Francis. Uh, which is a great thing to do, but particularly to do it today, which of course is the feast of Francis of Assisi. Now the story goes that um, when he was elected, when George Bajolio was elected, uh, there was, I can't remember who the cardinal was who said to him uh, as he was walking down, don't forget the poor. And it was at that moment that um, uh, George Bergoglio decided he would take the name Francis. It's always fascinated me that he's the first Pope uh, to have ever taken the name Francis. I would have thought it was a bit of a no-brainer. But uh, we know from his papacy uh, how extraordinary he has been for the poor, in whatever way poverty has been manifest. Um, he's been extraordinary in that way. Francis of Assisi, of course, it's, it's alleged he once said, I'm not sure it's actually true, but it, let's believe it was because it suits the argument, uh, preach the gospel always and if necessary use words. And we have seen in the papacy of Francis, um, it's not just a talking thing, it's very, very much a, a doing thing. Uh, his humility is extraordinary. And so is that of Father Bernard Teo. So we're delighted, Bernie, that you could be with us this evening and uh, to reflect and to share with us. Bernie, welcome. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Now, can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me clearly? All right, good. Now, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me here uh, on this very feast of St. Francis. Uh, to reflect on the papacy of Pope Francis. Now today I was at the uh, Church of St. Augustine. Father Victor has COVID, so, so I, I covered for him. And I spoke to the people just reflecting on who Francis was. He's one of the most beloved saints of the Catholic Church. And his inspiration never dies. It's always with us. And interestingly, uh, I told the story of Mr. Mikhail Gorbachev. Now, he died a few weeks ago. And when I was doing my training as a Redemptorist, my novice master, he said, there's something about Mr. Gorbachev. There's some Christianity in him. And I said, well, you know, the thing that strikes me about him is that he has that humanity about him. So my novice master, who is a canon lawyer, he said, I think he's a closet Christian. And you know, many Russians, they hate Mr. Gorbachev because they blame him for the dissolution of the USSR. And I remember the Berlin Wall that collapsed in 1989, many attributed to Mr. Gorbachev's policies. Now, interestingly, I always thought about his humanity. Where did that come from? And a couple of Sundays ago, I just happened to turn on my, my radio. I was driving somewhere. And 
the ABC had a little report on Mr. Gorbachev in tribute to him. And the story was that when he was a boy, this seems to be from Mr. Gorbachev himself, his mother used to take him to the church of St. Francis. And Gorbachev, he spent a lot of time praying to St. Francis. And he said, I'm very inspired by him. And that's why when he became the president of the USSR, there is so much humanity in him. And I, I find it extraordinary that he could say, I'm inspired by St. Francis. So Francis, he's not just a beloved figure in the church, but he was known as one of the greatest reformers in the church. Because at the time when Francis was alive, the church was preoccupied with wealth and political power. Actually, there are a lot of corruption in the church. And the story behind Francis and his work was that he had a religious experience. And the Lord said to him, Francis, repair my church. And Francis took that. In the history of the church, whenever the church is in deep trouble, God always sent great reformers to bring the church back to the heart of the gospel. And so Francis was very appropriate for his time. That's why he emphasized poverty. You learn to depend on God just as Jesus did by his whole way of life. It's about surrendering ourselves to God and depending on his providence. And that's why the Franciscans were known for their poverty. Counterculture to the official church. Many of whom are caught up in this wealth and power. So together with St. Clair, they became the great reformers. So, when Pope Francis picked the name Francis, I thought it was very unusual because we never had a Pope by the name of Francis. And not only that, he, he was an outsider not from Europe, but someone who, was, who has migrant background in Argentina. So somebody who is a total outsider to the European establishment, ecclesiastical establishment. So when he picked the name Francis, I said, my God, we are coming in for a wild ride. Because straight away I pick up the significance that he is going to be a reformer. So after he became Pope, which was just around Easter, the tradition in the Vatican was that on Holy Thursday night, the Pope washes the feet of 12 cardinals. Pope Francis didn't do that. In fact, he did something so unusual, it was quite a shock to the Vatican establishment. Instead, he went to prison to wash the feet of 12 
prisoners, a couple of whom were women. Not only that, one of them was Muslim. So I remember there was a big, big stir. What is he doing? So they began to discuss. Did he do anything wrong? Why is he against something that is so traditional in the Holy Thursday ceremonies? And one of the conclusions was that he didn't break any divine law. If I were to do it, you can be sure that I will have some kind of dis disciplinary actions taken against me. One of my fellow redemptors, he was giving a retreat in this old girls' school. This was in India. And it was Holy Thursday. There were no boys. So he picked 12 girls. The bishop, when he found out, said, you don't ever come to my diocese again. But this was the mindset. So when Francis did it, he said, but he spoke, we can't do much. So the only excuse was that he didn't break any divine law. But they missed the point. It's a very glaring, important point. What Pope Francis is doing, what Pope Francis is saying, something new is here. With the washing of the feet of these people, he has given the first clear signal on what his pontificate is going to look like. He intends to be, first and foremost, a bold, universal pastor, after the heart of the Good Shepherd, from whom he received his mission and mandate through the church. No one, and particularly the least, is ever going to be ignored or forgotten. And his priority is to bring attention to the little people, those who are ignored or thought to be best left forgotten as very often they are an embarrassment to establishment circles. And Pope Francis, in the course of his pontificate, he, he speaks about the globalization of indifference. And so he keeps harking back. No one is going to be forgotten. And he intends to bring into prominent focus and into public consciousness all those who suffer in one form or another. So like the Good Shepherd, he wants to give a clear signal that they are all important to him and to God. So you, you follow what I'm trying to say at this, up to now? What, what he is about. So he, he takes us to uncomfortable spaces. Now to understand Pope Francis, we have to go back to what happened to us about 60 years ago when we began the Second Vatican Council. in 1962, which ended in 1965. It was a time of reform. And the key issues that the church was, was dealing with 
It's about change. And it's about doctrinal fidelity. It's about tradition. And in the past 60 years, we have been fighting over this. What is being faithful to tradition? What is the meaning of changes in the church? And today we experience that. When you talk about synodality, you see some of our bishops are still very resistant to that. Now Pope Francis is talking, we must learn to listen. Now part of the change, you can't depend on the bishops and the priests. You have to bring the lay people right into the heart of the church decision-making process. Everyone has a place in the church. Now this is something we, we have difficulty in grappling with. Now very often these issues uh, divide the church. They divide the church at all levels, sometimes quite bitterly. From the bishops down to the clergy and right down to the lay person in the pew. And very often, families are all caught up in that. Now, I have no doubt that many of those who are very passionate about the positions they take, they are people of great faith as well. And they are people of goodwill. And they're committed to what they believe to be right for the church. Now Francis, in his interview that he gave about six months after his, he took office as Pope, he gave an interview to Father Antonio Spadaro a Jesuit, um, a, he, over three sessions. Uh, it, it's for a number of Jesuit publications. I'll, I'll, I'll take you through some of the things he said. All right. So this was what he said in 2013 six months after he took office. And this interview gave us insights into his concerns for the church. Now, what is important to him? Now, this is what he said. I dream of a church that is a mother and shepherdess. Now, interestingly, he used female imagery. I don't know why he didn't want to use male. But fair enough, that's his preference. The church's ministers must be merciful. Take responsibility for the people and accompany them like the good Samaritan now, interestingly, he keeps going back to the Good Samaritan who washes, cleans, and raises up his neighbor. I dream of a church, especially the ministers, they are like that. They are shepherds after the heart of the Good Shepherd. This is pure gospel. Now based on the conviction that God's love for us is greater than our sin. And that's why I say Pope Francis is taking us back to the heart of the gospel. Then he touched on structural changes. Um, 
structural changes and organizational reforms, they are secondary. Now, when you, I, mean, I don't know how many of you were present at the Synod. Do, 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 you, do you get yourselves involved in all this discussion of what, what is the church going to look like? Now, you, you listen to Pope Francis. He said, well, these are important. They are secondary. But many in the church, we are stuck there as if they're the most important. Right now, it's a lot about structural changes. Now, this is what he said. These are secondary. They come afterwards. The first reform must be the attitude. Now, I think this is very explosive stuff. Now, what he's saying is that we all must repent first. Just like Jesus appearing on the scene at the beginning of his ministry, repent and believe in the good news. The kingdom of God is close at hand. Now, Francis has the same message. God has redeemed you and God loves you. And so the first thing you must do is you embrace it. That's why the change in attitude. We need to be converted. We need to repent. And when you accept the gospel message at its very beginning, at its very core, then this is how you do your ministry. The ministers of the gospel must be people who can warm the hearts of the people, who walk through the dark night with them, who know how to dialogue, and to descend themselves into the people's night, into the darkness, but without getting lost. Now, these are very powerful words. What he's saying is, we take the incarnation very seriously. God emptied himself and came among us to walk with us, to share everything about us. He is one of us. So what he's saying, what Francis here is, the church's ministers, they must be one of the people, among the people. That's why one of the statements that he make in regard to the training of seminarians, is that I think it's good for seminarians to live with families as part of their training so that they know how people live. And I have no doubt he's right on that one. Sometimes the way we are trained, we are quite removed from the people, and that is a bit disconcerting for me. I want them to be able to connect with people. So we are going back to the heart of the gospel where it was proclaimed that Jesus did not count his equality with God, something to be upheld, but he emptied himself taking the form of a servant. And he walked among us. Hopefully we don't get lost, okay? Because the good shepherd didn't get lost. But I think for us clergy, we can get lost. So what Pope Francis is saying, well, they, there's a lot of things to unpack here, but I think he's right on this one. Ah, here it is. I think you, you, you resonate with this. The people of God want pastors, not clergy, acting like bureaucrats or government officials. Now, these are strong words, and he meant it. 
it's about bureaucracy and sometimes in the church we have we have an og over organization of bureaucracy so he's trying to crack that you see as, as a reformer you see the bishops particularly must be able to support the movements of God among their people now he's aiming at bishops <laughs> with patience so that no one is left behind but they must also be able to accompany the flock that has a flair for finding new paths in other words you encourage initiatives from the ground upwards and in our church we say that the church the official church we don't have all the answers to your particular questions and what we want you to do is to encourage you to to help find life and solutions to our experiences and Pope Francis is reopening that you see part of the problem in the Vatican is very often the over centralization of bureaucracy and authority and sometimes they stifle initiative on the ground and what Pope Francis wants to do is that we as pastors we accompany the flock that often has a flair for finding new paths and interestingly uh, in in one of his uh, images that he used he he said sometimes the the pastor is at the head of the flock sometimes he walks in the middle other times he walks at the back now this is what he's talking about and I'm in perfect resonance with him on that point ah this is the thing the church sometimes has locked itself up in small things in small minded rules whether people should be receiving communion in the tongue whether they should come back with veils it's those kind of things that are being discussed at times and he said without neglecting these things something more important is here the most important thing is the first proclamation Jesus Christ has saved you see we emphasize a lot of fidelity to doctrines now what he said in this interview is that the dogmatic and moral teachings of the church they are not all the same they're not on the same degree for example some of the doctrinal teachings dogmatic teachings of the church you can't change for example <clears throat> the creed that we recite every Sunday I believe in God the Father Almighty and so on we recite after the the homily now it took us it took the church 400 years to come to this conclusion it's about Jesus it's about him being a human it's about the role of Mary it's about sin it's about the resurrection now all these are settled these cannot change but other things we can change all right so that's why he said not all are the same now this is <laughs> no wonder they want to kill them of this say the church's pastoral ministry cannot be obsessed with the transmission of a disjointed multitude of doctrines to be imposed insistently proclamation in a missionary style focuses on the essentials on the necessary things 
It's about the good news of the gospel. This is what fascinates and attracts what makes the heart warm, burn, as it did for the disciples at Emmaus. Now, if you follow the gospel, when Jesus was doing his teaching, he had huge crowds. And they were flocking to him. What was their experience? Something new is here. He doesn't speak like our teachers. He speaks with authority. He speaks with fascination. Whether you love him or hate him, you just cannot ignore him. Now, this is what Pope Francis wants the church's minister and the church to do that. And so we have to find new balance. The church's role is not to straighten up people's lives. People's lives will always be messy. This is the price of freedom. We always, in some form, of messiness. That's why we talk about ongoing conversion. But first, the proposal of the gospel must be more simple, profound, radiant. If you accept the gospel, you accept the message of Jesus, you accept what Jesus has done for you, then this is how you live. The moral consequences flow. Now, I like the way St. Paul puts it. You are now being renewed in Christ. Because you are a new creation, you are baptized into him. Live a life worthy of your calling. That's where morals come in. You make decisions. Be faithful because you are asked to be like him. Okay? So this is what he said, okay? I, I see clearly that the thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness proximity the church must walk with people that's why the pastoral compassion of God is so important yeah. and this is one of his favorite images I see the church as a field hospital after battle and what he's saying is that the people on the ground they try to, their best to live in fidelity to the gospel in very difficult circumstances. And sometimes they get battered down. And they don't know where to turn. And I see this all the time, those of us in pastoral ministry. People with all kinds of difficulties and trying their best to be faithful to the gospel. Now this is what Pope Francis is referring to. The church must be a field hospital. You see? No, this, <laughs> this is too much. It is useless to ask a seriously injured person if he has high cholesterol and about the blood, about the level of his blood sugars. You have to heal his wounds. And then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds, heal the wounds. And you have to start from the ground up. Now when you look at the gospel, uh, how Jesus did his ministry. Sometimes he didn't teach at all. Instead, he knew that the people were hungry. So he fed them first. And after they are satisfied, and then he started to teach. And as teachers, 
when you have hungry students, they won't be paying attention to what you're teaching. And this is the point of Pope Francis. You must love the people first, heal their wounds, be a healing presence and fulfilling presence. And the ministers of the church must be ministers of mercy above all. In pastoral ministry, we must accompany people and we must heal their wounds. And then he talks about Jesus, what he did. He was quite scandalous to the religious people. All right? And today, Jesus says to all of us and even to those who are seduced by clericalism. Gee, this is powerful stuff. Some of us are seduced by clericalism and he is trying to shake that. The sinners and the prostitutes will go before you into the kingdom of heaven. In other words, we need reforms among the clergy. All right? Now, on changes in the church. Now, change is a difficult thing. Many of us don't like to change. We like the familiar. And change is always stressful. I, I heard people saying to me, you know, they, I hate John the 23rd. He really upsets everything. John the 23rd was the beginning of the reforms in the church. Now, this is what Pope Francis has to say. And he referred to Cardinal Newman. And Pope Francis canonized Cardinal Newman last year in November. So for Cardinal Newman, here on earth, to live is to change. And to change is to become more perfect. <laughs> this is strange. Because the only person that don't change is God himself. Everything else changed. And he, when he was talking about the necessity for change, it is in the nature of the church to change. The church has always been evolving, been evolving from the very beginning. And if the church doesn't evolve, we die. Okay? So only God is constant. And then he said it is not any kind of change. You don't change for the sake of change because it's the latest thing to do. It's the it's a fashionable thing to do. But to change, you have to be faithful to tradition. You see? And all of us, we are changing ourselves from our own experience. Now you ask yourself, are you the same person today than you were when you were a teenager. You change. Was it pleasant? No. Sometimes it's very tough, but you grow. So same with the church. And that's why when he talked about church structures, he said when the church structures doesn't serve the people, when the church structure doesn't serve the mission that Jesus gives to us, then we do some reforms to the structures. And sometimes if the structures are, are useless, we throw them out and we start new ones. All the time in the service of the community and in the service of mission. Okay? At the center of everything is the stability of God. All right, now I have touched on this. So he was talking in terms of uh, we are not in an era of changes, 
but we are in a change of era. Something big is happening to us in our world. So it's not just that because the church is part of, of the world. And that's why when Pope Francis talk about the church and in many of his messages, we are one people, one humanity before God. There is no place for communalism. There is no place for racism. We are all one. The earth is our only home. And we are one people before God. You see? We are living through, what we are living through is not just an era of changes, but a change of era. And he said the changes must be genuine. It's not cosmetic changes, but changes that touch the hearts. And so following this interview, he canonized Pope John XXIII and Pope John Paul II. Now, We have never canonized two popes on the same day. Never in our history. And not only that, we have never canonized two popes in our own era. We remember them. So some of us are pro John the twenty third, others are pro John Paul the Second. So when he canonized these two popes, Many people say, well, what a wonderful thing to see two popes canonized at the same time. And they are so different. Now what Pope Francis is saying is this. John Paul, he was known as the, the one who dampened some of the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. Because he wanted to go back to tradition. And I think he's right in some ways. He's right. John the twenty third, he symbolized change. And what Pope Francis is doing and giving the message to the church is that we need to change, but we at the same time we must remain faithful to tradition, the best of our tradition. You need both. It's not either or. That is the meaning and message to the church. So he's not against any of them at all. So to say that, oh, he is anti John Paul II, no, that's not true. He said, we need, we need John Paul and the, the, the things he stands for. All right? So he did that on April 27, 2014. And after that, okay, following the canonization, he began, where is it now? He began the proclamation of the Jubilee Year of Mercy starting on December, 20, uh, December 8, 2015 to 2016. So with this proclamation, the three pillars that he was very concerned about, reforms, changes, fidelity to tradition, and then the church must have a heart. And that's why the proclamation is so important. So in, this was issued in, on the 11th of April, 2015. the document on mercy. So I will quote from, from him what he said of mercy. 
Mercy is the very foundation of the church's life. Now you see, he takes, this is most important. It's the foundation of the church's life. All of our pastoral activity must be caught up in the tenderness she makes present to believers. Nothing in her preaching and in her witness to the world can be lacking in mercy. Now these are strong words and I believe he's right on this because it is this time was to return to the basics. What is that? And what to bear that? with the weaknesses and st- <laughs> All right here. Now he said this perhaps we have long since forgotten how to show and live the way of mercy. It's a reminder. That's why he talks about we must change our attitude and go back to this. Encounter the gospel anew. It, it is, is time, time to return to the basics <laughs> and God help us to bear with the weaknesses and struggles of our brothers and sisters. Mercy is the force that reawakens us oh, to new life and instills in us the courage to look to the future with hope. All right. The church stop. is commissioned. Wait, wait, hold on first. Yeah, um, the church is commissioned to announce the mercy of God, the beating heart of the gospel, which in its own way must penetrate the heart and mind of every person. So that's why I say Pope Francis is taking us back to the heart of the gospel. And the church must pattern her behavior after the Son Son of of God God. who went out to everyone without exception. Jesus, I can't can't stop. In the present day, as the church is charged with the task of the new evangelization, the theme of mercy needs to be proposed again and again with new enthusiasm and renewed pastoral action. Okay, now... So here, Pope Francis continues, right? It is absolutely essential for the church and for the credibility of a message that she herself live and testify to mercy. Her language and her gestures must transmit mercy so as to touch the hearts of all people and inspire them once again to find the road that leads to the Father. All right, now, if, if you think that this is something that Pope Francis himself is saying, you go back to 1980. John Paul, he was Pope, he became Pope in 1979. And his first encyclical was the Redeemer of Man, Christ the Redeemer. The second encyclical issued in 1980 was Rich in Mercy. Now it's quite interesting to to see what John Paul himself said. And when you look at what Pope Francis said, it's it's almost from, from what Pope John Paul has said. The fact that it's on the level of encyclical shows how important it is. Now, John Paul said this, the present day mentality, more perhaps than that of people in the past, seems opposed, wait, where where did I get that? Uh, Seems opposed to a God of mercy, and in fact, tends to exclude from life and to remove from the human heart the very idea of mercy. Now, it's quite interesting, John Paul said that. But it never got the attention that Pope Francis did. It was just buried somewhere. Right? 
Now, this is what John Paul said. The church must profess and proclaim God's mercy in all its truth as it has been handed down to us by revelation by the person of Jesus Christ. We need to go back to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, this is it. The church lives an authentic life. Where did I? The church lives an authentic life when she professes and proclaims mercy. The most stupendous attribute of the Creator and of the Redeemer. And when she brings people close to the sources of the Savior's mercy, of which she is the trustee and dispenser. You see, Revelation, the bishops, the popes, we are just trustees. God has revealed this is who I am. And this is what I came for. And that's why many of the theologians, uh, we have this thing we call Jesus, the pastoral compassion of God made visible. So what Pope Francis has done in continuation with Pope John Paul II, this time he put it in more stark terms. Who is God to us? It's not about religion. I think part of our problem is that very often we have too much religion dealing with things. But at the very core, it's about our relationship with God. And if you follow Sunday's gospel, when Jesus talked about you, if your faith is like the mustard seed, you can tell this tree, mulberry tree, be uprooted and plant yourself into the sea and it will do it. He is raising this question about our relationship with God, our living relationship. And Pope Francis has asked us to do that. All right, so I, I will just stop there and maybe we have a little couple of minutes break and we talk among ourselves and you raise your questions to me. Will that be all right? Um, will, will that be okay? Uh, well, I, 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 can, I, I, I think that's about it. Yeah. Well, I, I can go on and on, but it's just I, I, I think... There are a lot of things that I, I could put in, but uh, yeah. I I published this piece on mercy, the key to appreciating Pope Francis' papacy. It's about it's about twelve pages. It wasn't meant to be published. I was uh, asked to give a lecture online to the Catholic University of Zimbabwe. I was in New Zealand and they asked me to do it. <laughs> that was uh, in, in, in October, late, late October last year. So they asked me to write up just for private circulation among the, the students and the faculty of the Catholic University there. And I showed it to my Franciscan friend in New Zealand he said, are you going to publish this? I said, no. He said, no, you've got to get it published because it deserves a wider readership. You have put your finger on the pulse. And so I sent it to the Australian Catholic Record and the first thing the, the editor, uh, Father Gerald Kelly, who is a very good theologian himself, he said, I'm going to send it to two referees. That means he wanted to publish it. And I was surprised that he chose to publish it in April. I thought the earliest would be July. So he, he felt it's important because the church here is quite divided over Pope Francis. And what my article has done was to, to bring a kind of a reconciliation. Uh, some of my friends in the States, they, they, they thought it's a, it's a very uh, insightful article. This is the feedback that I have, yeah. Or a group of you, 
Okay, be, be, before I be, be, before you start, I I have the, this one which is very important from from Pope Francis. Going back to the person of Jesus Christ who revealed the Father. So this is what he said. It must be for the church. Mercy is not only the working of the Father. It becomes the criterion, the benchmark for knowing who his true children are. Now th this is this is a tough challenge. When we show mercy, we are revealing the face of the Father. And that's why in the Sermon on the Mount, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So it is true that at times we act as arbiters of grace rather than its facilitators. So I, I just keep emphasizing this again and again. And that's why I, I teach moral theology as the art of pastoral compassion. Not to put people on the straight and the narrow, but to make people, to help people to respond to God's love for them. When you love, you give everything. In your difficult situation. Okay? So, okay, now I, I take your questions. Um, Father Bernard, thank you. Just over here. Who is that? Just here. Yes. Yeah. yes. We were having a chat uh, about this woundedness that Pope Francis speaks about. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we as laity can have these wounds he healed, whether there's an option, whether there's a, a direction the church can take in terms of recognizing and encouraging, for example, counseling, or yes. like quite technically going into that space of, of trying to heal people's wounds. Uh, yeah, the, the, the healing very often is a communitarian activity. And the church must have support structures for that. So I, some time ago uh, in New Zealand, we, we were talking about the euthanasia legislation that comes in. And in fact, it is active now. So one of the things that I raised, I, because I was asked to be in this committee, what do you recommend to the parishes? How are you going to deal with some parishioners who may ask for euthanasia? They're hurting. Otherwise, they won't go through that. And I said, it would not be right for the church simply to say, we are opposed to this. That's not good enough. What are we doing? What, are, what kind of uh, uh, creative, responsive structures that we help people in those kind of situations? So they don't, they don't even think about taking that step. So every parish must have some kind of ministry made up of volunteers or even paid workers to help people towards the end stages of life. So it's a, it's a kind of a support system. This is just one example. It could be um, in terms of marital difficulties. We need pastoral care for, for all aspects of life. And I myself, I, I do quite a bit of that. Because I never sting, I never sting in regard to my time, uh, as long as people need to speak. Uh, they need somebody to listen. I'll give my time. But I, I'm only one limited person. What I'm asking for is that parish structures. Sometimes, um, 
you, you know, those at the end stages of life very often is very stressful for the families, for example, and they feel they are alone. So what the pastors can do is that they, the pastors can organize help groups. I, I learned this when I was at the University of Notre Dame in 2011. Uh, this was in the States. And I remember the parish priest, we were talking about looking after those at the end stages of life. He said, I have this parish and uh, she was looking after this, the mother and she forgot to look after herself. And uh, the parish priest saw her and said, oh, look at you, even your hair is not done, your nails, terrible. So he organized a group to relieve her on a regular basis. Take her out to the hairdresser, get her nails done, take her out for a movie, take her out for for some kind of recreation. And then they have volunteers to look after the mother. And it's a kind of a parish support. For many of those at the end stages of life, they felt embarrassed that they are a burden to others. So part of the healing process is that when you have communal support, we bear one another's burdens. Okay, and it, it takes various forms. And not just at the end stages of life, but in family difficulties and all that, we, we need support systems. But then the culture is that we value our privacy and we value our autonomy. Very often, we don't reach out to others or we are embarrassed to let others to come in. So I, 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 I meet different cultures. You think of the Samoans and the Tongans and the, the, the Cook Islanders and the Fijians. Very strong communal bonds. So these kind of questions they hardly arise. But once the cultures mix, um, this autonomy thing will come a lot stronger. And that's where part of the euthanasia uh, thing become, become attractive. Because it's about the exercise of I decide when and where I take this step. And it's always a, a, a communitarian experience. Will, will, will that help, help them? Answer some of your, 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 your issue? Yes, now, in terms of communal support, I, that's why the, the, the parish, the, the parish community is very important. Yes. Yes. Um, in our schools, I have a, a ladder system where you have a home group going through every year level. Yes. And they stay in that same home group. And school for many young people is church mm -hmm. because of the hospitality yes. and the way they come to encounter each other. Yes. And of course the side effect hopefully is the prayer. They say prayers together. Yes. They don't experience hospitality in, in church as we understand church. Yes. They don't feel that ch church is just mm -hmm. based on the limited education of about our Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. How would you encourage a young person uh, to connect and come into the community of the church. Mm. I realise I need their peer group. I realise I feel they need each other to be in church. Yes. When they do come to church, they feel strangers. Yes, I and I And they feel comfortable in their school church. Yes. But that's not the same as coming around the altar. Yeah, correct, yeah. And so the question is, how can we nurture their desire to come into church with us, our community, right. and how can we reach out to them in hospitality and show mercy and friendship? Yes. If that makes any sense. I do, I do. Now, because I, I, I just came, from, came back from Auckland, and we, the Redemptors, we, we hand our parish back to the diocese after 70 years. And it was quite a shock to the system 
because the people are so used to us and suddenly we are gone and there's that grieving process. And so we have, the parish is going through a period of amalgamation with another parish, neighboring parish. And the priest, uh, Father John Dunn, who is the cousin of uh, Bishop Pat Dunn, he, he was very glad that I was around because I was stuck in New Zealand. So to help them through the transition process. So one of the things he did and which we, we organized among the young people, you, you see, the young people, one of the things we learned is that they're, they're quite alienated from, from the general uh, pulse of the parish. They don't feel at home. And it's natural. And so what they did in which we, we, we got together is that we have in the church on a regular basis special gathering for the young people with the support of the wider parish. So we let them run their show together with some input and we have to take them at where they are. I, like we have to listen to what are their cultural experience among the young people because they, they have their own language. They, they have their own way of doing things. And one of the things we need to do is to listen, uh, to let things be, to let things be messy at times. But this is where you provide an opportunity for listening and learning and teaching. In other words, we need to enter into their world and at the same time give them that kind of space. Now, let's say if you have this in a parish, are you free enough to do that? Well, will that help you to... Well, well actually, uh, I'm a Salesian and I work with young people. Yeah. And uh, it's challenging to, to journey with them yes. and be where, where they're at. Yes, exactly. But I'm always searching for options or ideas exactly. to call them into a closer inc so they encounter Christ. Yes. So, so I, I, I find this challenging among the, the teachers because I, I just finished this course in Ballarat with, with a group of 29 teachers. And they were dealing with similar issues. And this time, one of my students, he wrote on how can we, in our Catholic schools, be places of hospitality for the LGBTQ community? Now, what kind of language are we going to use? What kind of uh, uh, a culture are we developing? And we take official church teachings. We, we take uh, the, the pastoral approaches. So I, I see the, my teachers, those who did the course with me, uh, they, they grapple with this. And I thought some of them did a marvelous job. But it is, it's a learning process because they have to enter into the world of these people. And then you develop a Catholic culture that is faithful to what the official church is saying at the same time, above all, be faithful to the gospel. And my conviction is that the gospel is always capable of renewing itself. The word of God is always new and always old. Capable of meeting new challenges. And that is for us to do it. And at the same time to believe that God is faithful to us and God will be with us. I've read that book called The Wounded Shepherd about oh, yes. Pope Francis, a fantastic book about his attitude and his partial sensitivity. Yes. So you've captured that again tonight, so thank you very much for that. Yeah, no, no, I think he's right in that. You, know, you, you learn to suffer with people. This is a part of our problem. Part of our problem of clericalism is that 
we we operate by remote control, and and that is pretty destructive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what else? Thank yes. you very much, Father Bernard, for your talk. Yes. You mentioned early on about the vision of Pope Francis with regard to a synodal church. Yes. What are you, the steps that you think that we need to make towards that? The synodal church. You, you see, when we talk about the synodal church, the primary conviction is that all of us are baptized into Christ. We are God's people. You see, when the Second Vatican Council began the, the constitution, the dogmatic constitution on the church, when they presented the first draft, the church is the hierarchy. The first thing they did was to throw that draft out. And later on, we accepted another draft. We defined the church first and foremost as the people of God, among which is the hierarchy. So what it means, this has tremendous implication for synodality. <laughs> it means all of us have a place in the church. We have our roles. In the way that St. Paul puts it, all of us has gifts for the good of the community. And therefore, the role of the pastor, the, the role of the shepherd, is to bring the best out of these in the service of God's people and in the service of the gospel. And therefore, one of the first things we need to do is the attitude of humility and the capacity to listen. See, part of the problem in the church is that very often we, we, we don't know how to listen anymore. And Pope Francis keep emphasizing this. Listen, listen, listen because the Spirit of God emerges in most unexpected places. Does that help you? Yeah. So you, you see now, it's quite interesting. <laughs> A few weeks ago, Pope Francis, he, put, he appointed two women into that, that, that office where bishops are appointed. It has never been done before. Can you imagine that two women in that place giving their input when bishops, their names, potential bishops, their names are submitted to this particular office and then they vet the candidates. Now that's part of the listening process. Now that's part of synodality. We want input from everyone. Now John Paul, during his pontificate and Benedict, they dampened that part. John the twenty-third highlighted that. So we Pope Francis, we are back in a big way towards synodality. And that's why everywhere in the church we talk about this. It's about listening to the hearts of the laity, their concern, and we are moving together as a people of God. And each one of us, we have our place. All right? Yes, you, you want to say something? Yes, my name is Diane. I'm from yes. St. John's Parish, Mitcham. Yes. I was very... Look, I think Pope Francis has been fantastic. Yes. Unfortunately, he disappoints me All right. insofar as when it comes to looking to women being leaders in the church, as in being priests within the church, because 
before you made the comment, I feel really nervous, I'm sorry. Um, you, you made the comment that the parish is the, uh, is the people. Yes. And that we are called to be who we are meant to be within that parish. Yes. Unfortunately, the hierarchy of the church stops us from being who we are sometimes. That, that is discussable. Sorry? Discussable. All right. There's no discussion about it. The church stops us at times from being who we should be. It can be on the way. It's not perfect. It needs conversion. And you're talking about women priests? Yes. I mean, it, I mean, no, a long you've... time ago in the, in, in the talk, it talked about the church being the shepherdess. Yes. But we are not allowed to be the shepherdesses. All right, a fair, a fair point. Now, if you ask me personally, I have no problem about having women ordained. Personally. But I respect the churches, the official churches position that they can make a decision in that regard. It, it, it's, not, it, it's not an infallible thing. They can change if they want to on this matter. Pope Francis has given consideration on it, but I think he don't want to go there at this point of his pontificate. And I doubt many, any Pope would. All right? Um, on, on this question of whether there are scripture, scriptural ground for not ordaining women, I, I remember many years ago the Pontifical Biblical Commission under that Canadian scholar, uh, David Stanley. They came up with a statement because they were commissioned to study whether there's any scriptural ground against the ordination of women. And the conclusion was there was no scriptural ground for that. Now you're talking about church practices, you're not talking about articles of faith. Just like whether we should have married clergy, married clergy. In practice, we have, because when the for example, the, the Anglicans who came over, some of them were married. We didn't say you've got to leave your family. So isn't that hypocrisy? No, not necessarily. Because in our tradition, for a long time we have accepted both. Married clergy, until about the 12th century when celibacy became a discipline. So recently, discussing the Brazilian situation, a lot of very committed Catholics, they, they live in very remote areas and they don't have clergy to service them. So the discussion on, was on whether we, we, we should be ordaining some, some of the, the people who could be, have been ordained. So can you just answer this question for me, please? Yes. Why does the Catholic Church allow women to be deacons, but not priests? I don't know. For a long time we have had women deacons, yes. We have had. This is not something that I, I'm competent enough to, to, to answer. But I won't call it hypocrisy. It's a lot more complicated than that.
right, thank you very much. Uh, sorry I can't answer everything, but, but I, I don't mind that. Yep, okay? Thank you.